Hello, my name is Sam Stewart. I am a veterinary emergency and critical care uh, specialist. I am here today to talk to you about the endocannabinoid system. So what we will be going over is what the endocannabinoid system is, what activates it, and then what its effects are on the body. For starters, let's break down the word endocannabinoid. That way we have a good understanding of this as we progress through this presentation. Uh, so for starters, we will look at the first portion, portion of this word, which is endo. Um, endo is actually a shortened form of endogenous. Uh, endogenous basically just means originating from the body or was produced within the body. So a good example of this would be your hormones. Your hormones are produced inside of your body, and therefore they would be considered endogenous hormones. Uh, the second portion of this word is going to be cannabinoid. A cannabinoid essentially refers to a group of compounds uh, that activate the endocannabinoid system. Um, and so these can be compounds that are both found within the body naturally or also ones that are produced outside of the body. Uh, this is something we're going to be talking about a little bit more here in just a couple of slides, so I'll make sure you get a better understanding of that. Um, one important thing to take away from this slide, though, is that the endocannabinoid system is a normal body system. It is found in both humans and animals and is present from the time of birth, um, and it is responsible for um, a number of functions around the body, um, which, again, we will also be covering here in just a minute. As far as the types of cannabinoids that are present, we will first talk about endogenous cannabinoids. So these are cannabinoids that your body has produced itself. Um, so essentially these are similar to hormones that your body makes that are activating the endocannabinoid system and eliciting the effects that uh, that system has. So there's really two main endogenous cannabinoids that your body makes. The first one being n arachidinoyl ethanolamine the second being 2 arachidinoyl glycerol. Um, obviously, those are big, long names, um, and so for that reason, there are shorter terms that we use for them, uh, being anandamide and 2-AG. So throughout the rest of this presentation, you will see them referred to as that. In addition to the endogenous cannabinoids, there are exogenous cannabinoids. Now, exogenous is the opposite of endogenous. So if you want to think of the opposite of endogenous, endogenous meaning made within the body, naturally you would then presume exogenous would mean made outside of the body. So really these are your cannabinoids that you're going to get from the cannabis plant itself. Uh, so some of the more common cannabinoids, um, I should say exogenous cannabinoids that people are familiar with are going to be things like tetrahydrocannabinol, which is THC, uh, cannabidiol, which is CBD, but in reality, there's actually well over 100 cannabinoids that have been um, studied to date, and there are actually still more being discovered even after that. Once these cannabinoids are in your body, whether it be exogenous or endogenous cannabinoids, there will need to be some way in which they can activate that endocannabinoid system so that their effects can then be elicited. And so this is where receptors come into play. Receptors are basically structures within your body that bind to circulating compounds such as cannabinoids or hormones um, and is what allows them to then elicit that effect that they are intended to have. So when it comes to cannabinoids, there are two main types of cannabinoid receptors in your body. The first one being CB1, which essentially stands for cannabinoid receptor type 1, and CB2, which stands for cannabinoid receptor type 2. Uh, when cannabinoids bind to these receptors, that is when the effect is elicited. In terms of what that effect is, it has several factors that it will depend on. The first being which of these you know, 100 or so cannabinoids is the one that's binding to the receptor which of these two receptors is it binding to, and where is that receptor located in the body when it is bound. First, let's talk about the CB1 receptors. These receptors are primarily located in the central and peripheral nervous systems. So to describe what these are, we have this picture here of a dog where you can see it's got its uh, brain, spinal cord, and peripheral nerves drawn. So brain being here, spinal cord going down the dog here, and then these peripheral nerves that are going down the leg. Uh, peripheral nerves uh, are not all drawn here in this image, so uh, what's not shown is how they also go down the front legs and how they also innervate the side of the dog over here. So those nerves are essentially going um, all over the body. As far as the central nervous system goes, that applies to the 
brain and spinal cords, you'll see next to each of these terms in parentheses, there's CNS. That stands for central nervous system. When you talk about the peripheral nervous system, that is referring to these nerves that are coming off of the spinal cord and innervating places around the body. So here next to nerves, PNS stands for peripheral nervous system. Next, we're going to talk about the effects of the CB1 receptors within the brain. There are four regions of the brain that are the most sensitive to the effects of the endocannabinoid system. So we're going to go through each of those regions right now. One thing just to be aware of before we get into that is that each of these regions of the brain will have different effects depending on which cannabinoid it is that is activating the uh, endocannabinoid uh, system in that section of the brain. And so when you think about our previous conversation, particularly with the exogenous cannabinoids or the cannabinoids that are derived from the cannabis plant itself, we currently know of well over 100 of them. And so each of those will have slightly varying degrees of, of what that effect is. And a, a big reason for that is going to be that each of these cannabinoids has a different strength or a different ability to, um, in terms of how strongly it can activate the, the endocannabinoid system in that region of the brain. And so when you're talking about your exogenous cannabinoids, THC is going to be your strongest of all of them. So of all of these effects, that we're about to go through and talk about, THC is going to be the one that's going to do that the most significantly in all of these regions of the brain. And that's going to be as opposed to something like CBD or cannabidiol, which will have similar effects, but just not to the same strength of it. And also you don't tend to have the psychoactive effects or the quote unquote feeling of high with cannabidiol like you would with THC, a big reason for that being that it's just not as strong as the THC molecule is. So the first region of the brain that we're going to talk about is the hypothalamus. So here in this picture, you can see it sort of in the central mid portion of the brain. The hypothalamus has quite a lot of important functions that it does in the body. But when it comes to the endocannabinoid system, one of the big ones is its effect on hunger and appetite. So when you have activation of the endocannabinoid system, you will notice that you will feel hungrier, you'll have a stronger appetite. Um, and this is going to be something that's pretty common across all of the cannabinoids, obviously THC being the strongest, but you will see these effects with CBD as well. Next after that, we're going to talk about the cerebellum. So this is in the lower back portion of the brain. The cerebellum actually is very important for your ability to move and walk. Um, it does a lot of um, effects with your coordination and your balance. So as you walk and put one foot in front of the other, your cerebellum is what's very important for, for coordinating that movement, making sure that you're not hitting your feet into each other, making sure that you're not throwing your balance off as you lift one foot off the ground. Um, and so when you have effects of the endocannabinoid system in, in interspersed in that, you'll start noticing that coordination will not be as good as it was before. Ability to balance will be a bit affected. Um, so a lot of the signals transmitted through the cerebellum are getting delayed. That will be more pronounced with THC. You don't tend to see these side effects with CBD until you start getting in some fairly high dosages of it. So as long as you're not going too high on the dose, you won't be seeing these side effects. But if you get the dose high enough, you will start seeing the similar effects that you would with, with THC in, in that cerebellum. Next, we're going to talk about the hippocampus. So this is sort of in the lower middle portion of the brain. Your hippocampus, again, has a lot of important functions that it does. But when you have activation of the endocannabinoid system, you'll start noticing effects on memory and emotion. So with memory, this is a common side effect that a lot of people report, particularly when they're under the influence of THC, which is that they have short-term memory loss. So hippocampus is somewhat to blame for that. And then um, in addition to that, it's going to be control of emotion. So a lot of people uh, reportedly use cannabinoids or THC for anti-anxiety reasons because it will have anxiolytic functions. And so the hippocampus is one of the regions of the brain that you'll have that effect on. Again, as we've already alluded to, THC is going to be the one that's going to do a lot of these the strongest. Um, you can get some of these effects with CBD and some of the other, cannabidiol, uh, the other cannabinoids, but um, you're going to start getting some higher dosages to really be noticing these effects. Lastly, we're going to talk about the amygdala, so also, also lower middle portion of the brain right next door to the hippocampus. Your amygdala um, also has some effects on memory, but a lot of effects on your cognition. And by cognition, we're referring to your ability to process and think and understand the information that is entering your brain. And so when you have activation of the endocannabinoid system, you'll notice a lot of these processes will be sort of slowed down or delayed. So the speed with which that you can think and process or your ability to fully understand what's happening around you uh, will be somewhat slowed down. Uh, 
when we talked before about the differences between THC and CBD with CBD not having your um, psychoactive effects like THC, this is going to be the one of the big ones that we're going to notice where you don't tend to see this delay in processing of, of thought and, and understanding with CBD like you would with THC. With the um, caveat to that being once you start getting into the much, much higher doses of CBD, then you can start seeing these effects. But typically at normal therapeutic dosages, you wouldn't see them. Next, let's review the effects of the CB1 receptors on the peripheral nerves. Again, just to remind you, the peripheral nerves are these ones that are coming off the spinal cord and innervating sites um, distant in the body, so away from the spinal cord. Uh, so in this picture here, the peripheral nerves are showing uh, the innervation of the back right leg. One thing to notice in this image is that there's some sort of a painful stimulus happening to this dog's back right leg. And so for that dog to A, be able to perceive that there is something painful happening, and then B, elicit a response to deal with that pain, there's a few things that need to happen. The first thing that needs to happen is that pain signal needs to be able to be transmitted up these peripheral nerves to the spinal cord. That signal then gets transmitted through the spinal cord to the brain, where it then can determine what the response needs to be, and then an exact opposite will happen, will that signal get transmitted back down the spinal cord, back down the peripheral nerves and will cause whatever the response needs to be to make that painful stimulus stop happening. So in this case, it'll most likely be that dog lifting its back right foot up off of whatever it was that was stepping on that was causing the pain. One thing that's important to be aware of with this is that when you have some sort of pain happening in the foot like that, there isn't necessarily one long continuous nerve that's going to carry that pain signal all the way to the spinal cord. More likely what's going to happen is that there's actually going to be multiple uh, separate nerves that that pain signal is going to have to go from nerve to nerve to nerve to make it all the way up to the spinal cord. The reason this is important is because this is the factor of how the cannabinoid receptors um, affect these nerve signal transmissions, and this is what we're about to go over next here with this next image. So what this image is showing are two nerves uh, back to back. So the, the top nerve that you're seeing here is the end of one nerve, and the bottom of this picture is going to be the start of another nerve. And so what's going to happen is when you have a pain signal that's getting transmitted through these nerves, it's going to have to get through this first nerve to then cross this gap and then continue its way down the second nerve. Now, as you can see, there is this big gap that they're having to cross. This is something called the synaptic cleft. And so there's a convenient way that the body has come up with to span that gap, which is these vesicle-like structures here, uh, which are essentially little bubbles. Um, and so this bubble is being outlined in yellow, and inside that bubble you see a lot of blue little dots. Those blue little dots are representing something called neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are basically substances or compounds that are going to help transmit that nervous signal across the synaptic cleft. And so what's going to happen is when there's some sort of nerve stimulus that's going to come into this uh, first nerve, it's going to tell that vesicle to go down to the bottom of the nerve. It's going to then open that vesicle and it's going to release those neurotransmitter substances into that synaptic cleft. As you can see here, one of those neurotransmitters has become um, attached to this sort of green Pac-Man looking structure. And what this is, is a receptor. Now, this isn't one of the cannabinoid receptors like we've just talked about. This is a receptor that's specific to these neurotransmitters. So not quite the same thing, but the idea of what it's doing is going to be the same. And so now once that binding has happened, we have now told this second nerve that there is a pain signal or, you know, for other nerves, some other sort of signal that it needs to continue to, to transmit through. So now that we've had that neurotransmitter bind to that receptor, that receptor will now create a new nervous signal um, and will transmit it through this nerve, which will then hopefully either carry it on to the spinal cord or to the next nerve where this process will be repeated. Next, let's review what the effects of cannabinoids are on this process of nerve transmission through our peripheral nerves. So for starters, we'll use the same image. We'll just implant a CB1 receptor up here on the terminal portion um, of our initial nerve, which is usually where they are located in those terminal regions. Uh, next, we will also throw in a CBD molecule, CBD being cannabidiol. Uh, we're going to specifically use CBD because this is the cannabinoid with the most potential therapeutic effect, and it's going to be the one that's going to be uh, most likely seen um, on the market for a medicinal use. 
if that CBD molecule goes up and binds to that CB1 receptor, we have now activated that receptor, and therefore we have activated the endocannabinoid system. When that receptor is activated, is going to have an inhibitory effect. Um, inhibitory effect basically meaning that it is going to inhibit something else from happening. And so that's something that is going to inhibit is it's going to go down to the end of this nerve and inhibit that vesicle from being able to bind to the bottom of this nerve, meaning that it is not going to be able to release that neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. And therefore, it is not going to be able to bind those neurotransmitters to this uh, receptor. So therefore, you have now interrupted that nervous signal. It has not been transmitted from nerve to nerve, and therefore, it's not going to make it to wherever its intended um, endpoint was. As far as CB2 receptors go, these are also located in peripheral nerves and will elicit a similar response that we just reviewed with the CB1 receptors, uh, but they are also located in pretty high concentrations in immune cells. Now, immune cells, as you can imagine, we're, are referring to the immune system. So there are several different types of immune cells that you can see. Uh, for starters, you can see immune cells in certain organs that have responsibilities related to the immune system. So those will be some organs like the lymph nodes around your body, your spleen has a lot of effects with the immune system, and it'll also refer to um, your white blood cells, which are also a very important portion of your immune system. So in this picture here, this is a blood smear from a patient. Um, these little red circles that you're seeing are, are red blood cells, and what you're seeing in the middle of this image are two white blood cells that are specifically a white blood cell called, called a monocyte, and so this is one of the types of white blood cells that you can see um, a significant number of CB2 receptors located on. Here we're going to quickly review what these um, immune cells, specifically the white blood cells, are doing within your body. Uh, so there always needs to be something that's going to stimulate that white blood cell. It's going to tell it that something is happening that the immune system needs to respond to. So in this image, uh, we're just going to simply poke it with a needle. Obviously, this is not what happens in real life, but this is going to be our way of, quote unquote, stimulating this monocyte um, or this white blood cell. What's going to happen is that monocyte is going to produce these things called cytokines. Cytokines are just a substance that these cells are able to produce and that they then excrete uh, into the uh, area surrounding them. Cytokines have a number of functions uh, specifically relating to um, A, calling additional white blood cells to that site where the first white blood cell released those cytokines, but they also do a number of other things. The big one that's going to be um, pertinent to this conversation is that they are going to elicit an inflammatory response or they're going to cause inflammation to develop. Now let's look at how this applies to an actual clinical patient. So here we're going to take our monocyte or our white blood cell and we're going to shrink it down and we're going to stick it in the knee joint of this dog here. So now let's say this is an older dog that has a lot of arthritic changes in that knee joint. Those arthritic changes are going to encourage activation and stimulation of that white blood cell. So it's going to encourage it to create its cytokines and to release them into the knee joint. And so all of those cytokines, as I said before, are going to encourage even more white blood cells to come to that area and have those white blood cells also release their cytokines. But the more significant thing is it's going to cause a lot of inflammation and therefore pain for this dog in that joint. Now we're going to review the effect that the cannabinoids have once they have activated the CB2 receptors. So again, here we will have our CBD molecule that's going to go up to this monocyte here. It's going to bind. And what that's going to do is it's going to reduce the ability for that monocyte to release those cytokines. So there's likely still going to be some degree of cytokine release, but it has definitely been reduced from what it was um, prior to the activation of the CB2 receptor. So in summary, endocannabinoid receptors in the endocannabinoid system are found throughout the body. They are controlled by both internally produced or endogenous cannabinoids, as well as those that are produced by the cannabis plant itself or exogenous cannabinoids. They have numerous effects on the body, including pain relief, appetite stimulation, and the reduction of inflammation. With that being said, there's numerous other applications that have been researched as well as other applications that maybe haven't even been discovered yet. So as you can imagine, this is a very exciting field of research and there's potentially going to be a lot of uh, positive benefits that will come to light with time. So definitely an area to continue to follow and, and see what comes. With that, that is the end of this presentation. Thank you for listening and we hope to see you for the next one.